engineer from off the railroad in Aberdeen is appointed to a big job. When Roosevelt came on, he was a he was a completely different flavor. We'd had uh, uh, pretty much an indifference because the federal government didn't touch you. Outside of the postmaster, you must remember there was damn little representation of the federal government. And all of a sudden, uh, a, a guy in our town, an engineer from off the railroad in Aberdeen, is appointed to a big job. Uh, what seems like a big job to us, he's getting twenty-six hundred dollars a year. And, uh, and, and things started happening to people you knew. And uh, families that you'd been associated with were all of a sudden started to get cash money from the farm program or from uh, FERA or the WPA. And, and these things became operative in your life. It came right down to, to Main Street and, and everybody knew it. And half of them loved it and half of them hated it. And uh, buildings started going up, the armories and what have you, so that there was a, an invasion of, yeah, there was an invasion of your life with, with actual manifestations. And, and uh, uh, this immediacy had an effect on you. And it was a good, it was a good thing because whether, and you know, funny part of it, half of, man, half of town is fighting it, Main Street's fighting it, you know. They had an they had a addiction to those green relief checks that were being cashed in their cash registers. Uh, and they would all been out of business had it not been for them. They were cursing Roosevelt, they were cursing uh, the big invasion of uh, private uh, affairs and the intrusion into their lives and this kind of thing. And at the same time, they were living off it. What really happened was a shift in point of view. Uh, we sort of backed into the 20th century as the yeastiness of experimentation that made the New Deal what it was. And it was because it was a revolution uh, that new things could be tried. And that is the thing that is, to me, crucial. And I think that uh, 100 years from now, uh, when the historians look back on it, they will say, well, there was a huge, big corner turned at that point. After all, uh, Hoover would <coughs> loan money to farmers to keep their uh, mules alive but he wouldn't loan money to them to keep their children alive. Now, this was perfectly right within the framework of classical thinking, because each individual, uh, if he couldn't get enough to eat, uh, that was because he wasn't on the ball. It was his responsibility. And uh, the uh, New Deal said anybody who's unemployed isn't necessarily unemployed because he's shiftless. Uh, the system doesn't provide the jobs. Yeah. This was a ex very exciting period to us. We were down here saving the country. There was just no question in our minds that we were saving the country. It was very exhilarating, yeah. yes, yeah. particularly to us youngsters. The best thinking you could contribute was making a very real contribution. There was an optimism, a, a, there was an evangelical quality uh, it was completely not. It had an adventure quality. That's right. No question. I became the head of a, a department with 75 uh, people. I had to hire them. I had to set up an organization. I worked out a work program. Uh, the challenge itself was, was, was great. It, it was a very important part of my own development of being given an opportunity as a youngster. You're 22 years old. That's right. It represented the idea of being asked big questions. What kind of production do you need in order to get full employment, for example? This was a whole new way of thinking. You were not prepared for it in school. That was old, stodgy stuff. And instead, if you wanted to start asking different questions, if you wanted to look for new answers, you needed new kind of people. And the youngsters who were around, not everybody, naturally, but those who, were, who showed that they could ask questions in a new way and think for themselves, uh, got, got opportunities. This is what was exciting. You weren't in the situation that the kids are today, where you're confronted with, with a, uh, the, the senses of, of impossibility, of hopelessness. Of, you were really part then of a sense that changes could be made. And you were part of a social transformation that was bringing results immediately. People who had been starving were, were able to, to, to eat. That, that you were part of something that was important and that changes could be made. That was the most important thing, that you could have something better and you could do something about it. There was a feeling that if you had something to say 
and if you had any ideas, that it would get to the top. The biggest thrill of my life was to hear a speech of Roosevelt's using a section of a memorandum that I had written with no idea that it would ever get to the White House. Uh, this is what Washington was like. The government did have a responsibility for basic human values. Roosevelt surprised everyone by uh, coming up with emergency programs which uh, uh, did take the most of the bite out of the uh, popular discontent, which of course was tremendous at that time. I remember in the, in the relief headquarters, a woman had been arguing and arguing to get some milk for her baby. You should have seen the things they were giving babies instead of milk. I remember seeing them putting uh, salt pork gravy in milk bottles and putting a nipple on there and the baby sucking this salt pork gravy, a baby, a real blue baby, you know, uh, dying of starvation. I've seen, you know, in house after house, I saw that sort of thing. Well, this woman was determined to get real milk for her baby, and she just raised, you know, all the cane she could um, until finally uh, she got it. She got up to the top supervisor, and they agreed to let her have a quart. And when they handed it out, of course, it was in a bottle in those days, she just got back, and she did as hard as she could. She threw it up against the wall, kapow, you know, and smashed it. I mean, this was the kind of spirit, you see. You know, not unlike uh, the kind of thing that you see today amongst the black people. But this was white people then, principally. They, were, they seemed to be the most militant ones at that time. Well, I was just an ordinary uh, caseworker that summer, just a volunteer. Uh, a couple of years later, I was an administrator. I mean, I set up a program in the state of Florida uh, for the migratory farm workers. Actually, the migratory labor program was the most advanced thing that I encountered in the whole administration. I know because I was there. And I was in charge of the camp. When the day came to open, we just opened the gate and let anybody in that wanted to come in. No hand picking, no references or anything like that. It was enough for us that a family wanted to live there and not on the canal bank. We didn't hire any white guards either. And nobody carried a club or a pistol in all that camp that held a thousand people. We just got them all together in the community center and told them it was their camp. And they could make it a bad camp, or they could make it a good camp. That was up to them. And there wouldn't be any laws or ordinances except the ones they made for themselves through their elected council. Then for a week they had a campaign in camp with people running for office the first time in their lives. And after the campaign, people voted for the people they wanted to represent them for the first time in their lives. And after it was over, they celebrated with a big dance in the community center. And nobody got drunk and disorderly. And nobody cut anybody with a knife. And the only reason was they had themselves a council. After that, the council made the laws and ordinances. Council said nobody's dog could run around loose. He had to be tied up. Council said a man couldn't beat his wife up in camp. And when a man came in drunk one night and did, he was out of camp by morning. Council said people had to pay their rent because out of that rent money came camp baseball equipment and it kept up the nursery school. So when people wouldn't pay, council put them out. Finally, council said, it's a long way to any store. We ought to have our own store. And that's how the co-op started. Without a dollar in it, the people didn't put up. Some of the men and women on that council couldn't so much as write their names. Remember, these were just country Negroes, off sharecrop farms in Georgia and Alabama, just common, ordinary cotton pickers, the kind Lowndes County planters say would ruin the country if they had the vote. All I know is my eyes have seen democracy work.